Well, welcome back to Talking With Tech. I'm Rachel Madel, joined today by Chris Bouguet. How are you, Chris? I'm fantastic now that my computer is working. We just crashed it. I know. Uh, it's You know why? It's because we're, we're missing our third link. <laughs> Lucas is not here today, which is, uh, which is sad. It feels lonely. It feels lonely the recording without Lucas. I know. We miss you, Lucas. Yeah, but now we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk without you anymore. <laughs> we're gonna just keep on keeping on. Um, yeah, Lucas is at a conference right now and unfortunately wasn't able to join us, but um, he's sorely missed. And especially because today we're we're talking about something I'm really excited. Um, we're talking about autism, and we had an interview with the Autism Society, and I'm really excited to just kind of dive in. This is an area that I work a lot in. I work with a lot of kids with autism. I have a lot to I have a lot to say. Um, and I'm just really excited because I think that it's an area of AAC that is, you know, it's, it's changing. It's exciting because a lot more people are realizing the power of AAC with kids with autism. Um, so let's, let's dive right in. I think, and I think the way that we can do that is first talk about, you know, what are the special characteristics that kids with autism bring to the table when it comes to AAC? I mean, I think one of the first common things, and it's, it's hard to talk about it because you don't want to overgeneralize because there's so many different people who have autism and their characteristics are different for everybody. So you don't want to just say, well, because you have autism, then I'm going to generalize and this is how it is for everybody. But in general, uh, people with autism have less like social communication, you know, so uh, the pragmatics are often difficult. Uh, uh, the different functions of, of, of why you're using language are like, well, why do I need to use language? It is some sort of, is sometimes difficult. Yeah, well, I think that the, you hit the nail on the head, the pragmatics piece. I think that a lot of times kids with autism don't understand the purpose of language a lot of times. And you know, when I work with kids who don't have autism, they're very interested in initiating, they're very interested in communicating, and that level of interest isn't always there with kids with autism. Um, I think that speaking to interests, kids with autism sometimes have very limited interests. Um, you know, so instead of bringing a toy bag out and having lots of fun toys that, you know, another child might be get, get really excited to talk about and to play with, you know, the kid with autism, you know, he's not interested. He might just like balloons or trains or whatever it might be. So I think that that's another kind of challenge when it comes to, you know, communication in general. Um, and we know that motivation is the key, right? We need to have a motivation to communicate. And when we're only motivated by a handful of things, that makes our job a lot more challenging, um, especially when, you know, we want to make sure we're giving lots of variety of language and exposure and, you know, how many different core words can you use with one stimulus? It's, it's, it's sometimes challenging. Absolutely. I think the other big characteristic is that it, just part of the definition of autism is that it affects language. So there is not just pragmatics, but in general, it's a disability that's related to language. And so in every case, you're probably going to have a speech language pathologist involved trying to help uh, build the language connections. What do words mean? How do we put words together? Uh, what are those different endings on words? And then how do we use words in different ways to have different meanings? Yeah, and kind of going off of that too, what happens when there's other intellectual disabilities at play, um, which I kind of, uh, that comes into my practice a lot. You know, kids have issues with learning. Kids with autism have issues with learning. And it's not, it, that language piece is, is, is hard. The receptive language, we know the expressive language is hard, you know, if we're trying to introduce AAC, but the receptive language a lot of times is, is challenging. Um, so I think that that's a huge piece. And I don't know about you, Chris, but I have a lot of experience with kids who have intellectual disabilities. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people feel like, we wouldn't do high tech AAC with a child like that because they won't get it or there's tons of myths around that. Do you experience the same thing? Uh, just this week, I heard it um, from an administrator that said, you know, that student over there because he has uh, Down syndrome, which is, of course, different than autism. Right. But of course, you could have autism and have Down syndrome. Right. Mm -hmm. But 
just because that student has an intellectual disability, I don't think we need to use that particular communication app. That communication app is more for those other sorts of kids. It's like, wait, what? No, no. There's, there, it doesn't work like that. Like that if you have autism, then you, you get this. And if you have a, an intellectual disability, like um, uh, maybe let's, let's say Down syndrome, then, then you get that. It's like we look at the individual characteristics of every student and then make decisions uh, based on those characteristics, it's not just these giant camps. Yeah, and I would argue that, you know, if we're having challenges with learning using AAC, high-tech AAC is actually even more important because that's what's, that could be the tool that helps, you know, it click for a child and allows them to understand and have the receptive language um, to really start solidifying these concepts and then using them. Um, and since we're in the, the spirit of myth busting, I have another myth that I'd like to bust. Um, you know, I work with a lot of kids who are very verbal, who I think is, it's imperative that they're using AAC. Um, you know, and, and a lot of teachers that I, I go into the classroom and I go into these IEP meetings and I'm recommending AAC and they're like, why this kid's talking, um, you know, but, but let's look at what they're actually saying. Are they, you know, using language spontaneously? Are they initiating? Are they, you know, formulating complex sentences? Um, you know, all these things need to be taken into account when we're thinking about a child's ability to quote unquote sp speak verbally. Um, because what I'm finding is, Yes, children might be very verbal with autism, but, you know, they're doing so much scripting. Everything is a memorized script sometimes, and that's not true language. That's I've learned this script that pairs with this routine and I can say it, um, you know, but I'm not able to break out of that script because I don't have the foundational tools um, necessary to formulate my own thoughts. Um, so what I'm doing a lot of is recommending AAC for kids who are very verbal. Um, I, I, whenever I'm talking to, to teams to try to impress upon the idea that AAC is useful um, for kids who are verbal, um, I talk about, you know, the scripts that they're using. Um, I always talk about the I want script because a lot of times kids with autism are using that. They're using that that phrase very frequently, um, you know, but they don't understand that I want is two separate words. Um, they just kind of have learned them as a chunked phrase. And, you know, we can't really go. We can't go a lot of places from that. We can't say mommy wants or you want. Um, we can't switch out the verb and use I with a different verb. Um, so what that shows me is that there's a receptive language challenge and difficulty. And what I love about AAC, especially high tech AAC, is that you have that message window and every word has an icon and it has, you know, the label. And so it really teaches this is two separate words. It, we take for granted the fact that we are literate. We read, we understand that I want is a two separate words, um, but kids don't under, always understand that. And that's one of the many benefits of using a high tech system for kids who are verbal with AAC. Yeah. You know, so Rachel, what's so interesting there is that I think what you're really talking about is not just high tech AAC, but high tech AAC that is got all the words, right? So, you know, um, it, it's, and usually those words are organized in some sort of fashion. So if you take the lamp words for life or pull a quote with the new crescendo or, or really any of the other ones, the words for the most part, try and stay in a similar area, right? And remove motor planning. I'm not even talking about that. Just that they're in this, is there, it's the words are, presented in a structured manner. So when that structure, uh, the way I like to equate it for people who often say like, well, well, yeah, they're, they're talking, they don't need this. Well, the, the high tech AAC is really a teaching tool for them to be even more verbal. And so here's how that specifically works is like, think back to when we were taking tests in our in our graduate program or undergraduate program, right? I mean, most people have taken a test somewhere in their life, right? Rachel, you took tests? Unfortunately, yes, I took lots of tests. All right. Um, and so when you took a test, you maybe had your paper, pencil, notebook, and you wrote, wrote down like some sort of mnemonic and you had it in the top right-hand corner, you know, okay, the, the uh, cranial nerves, and I got to memorize these and we can spit it back up on the test and see you write that, right? You know, right? I, you know, I'm like laughing over here because <laughs> I was actually ridiculed in grad school because I was, I need to write to learn. And I always had mnemonic devices, but I actually had a whiteboard. So I felt so guilty about wasting so much paper that I would just write it on a whiteboard, erase, write it on a right, right, 
write it on a whiteboard and erase. Um, and so everyone kind of knew me as the whiteboard girl uh, in grad school. So anyway, yes, continue though. Then you could remember, right? So it comes down to take the test. And if, whether you write it in a notebook or your whiteboard or wherever you had it, you can kind of picture where it was in your mind. You're like, okay, that was in the top right-hand corner. The, the nerves were X, Y, Z. Like that was three pages in in my notebook or that was the one I wrote in my red pen uh, and I wiped off, you know. Um, but you remember it because visually you, ha you have a visual model of how it looked for you, right? Um, that is how I picture students with autism learning language just in general, right? If you look at Temple Grandin and she talks about how you, you, know, you think in pictures, right? So here's thousands of words organized in some structure where they try to keep words in the same similar location. So a student can then visually think about okay, where are the words and how do I say them and how I combine them? And I find that analogy resonates with people because they go, oh yeah, I remember taking tests and using that same strategy, right? Well, that's what kids are doing for every single word, you know, and not just words, but parts of words and uh, tenses of words and other words related to those words. It's all thinking of it visually. Have you ever heard of the book Moonwalking with Einstein? No, no. It's a really good one. It has nothing to do with speech therapy or AAC, but what it is, is um, it's a journalist who he, it's all about kind of executive functioning um, skills, specifically memory. And he decides that he's going to try out or I guess audition for the world memory championships. So he deep dives into memory and how, you know, thoughts and concepts are stored as memories. And one of the biggest takeaways from that book for me was how strong our visual memory is. And so he talks about kind of all these hacks to remember, you know, excruciating details and things like that. And it's to visualize. Um, so that's when you were kind of talking about that analogy, which I love because I think everybody can relate to it. Um, it reminded me of that book and how powerful visual imagery is for memory. So absolutely. I think that's, that's exactly right. The other thing that I wanted to say to kind of go off of that as well, I work with a lot of children with autism who are verbal and they have extreme challenges with word retrieval. So, you know, they can't pull those words and say them, but the moment you put their device in front of them, it's like they can find those words so quickly. Um, so it's just a perfect reminder that, you know, we don't, it doesn't have to be so hard. You know, AAC makes things easier for kids and, even though they're verbal, why, why make them struggle? Um, you know, I, I've seen the, the wave of relief when a child's trying to communicate something to me verbally and I'm like, where's your device? I find it, I, I put it in front of them and it's just like this sigh of relief and they just, you know, quickly navigate to whatever it is, whatever word they're trying to find uh, or type, you know, if, if, if they're, you know, able to type. All right, Rachel, do something for me real quick, right? Yeah, you have a computer in front of you, right? I do. You do, right? Okay, put your hands over the keyboard, all right? All right. And tell me uh, what row is, um, what row and how many cells over is the letter C? What row and... Come, come on, Rachel, you type every day. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I've learned the motor plans, Chris. <laughs> but now, now take your hands away and look, right? So what I'm getting at from that idea is that just what you were saying, like kids have who have word recall, it's, it's like, here's another analogy, right? Tell me all your cousins, Rachel. Tell me all the names of all of your cousins. Right? Oh my goodness. Bill, Rich. But think, and see, your eyes float up, float up. And you guys can't see it, but I can see Rachel. Her eyes float up and she's thinking, well, who are my cousins, right? And trying to go through their names. But if I brought out a family photo album and said, hey, so what are the names of your cousins? You'd be like, oh, that's Bill, that's Rich, that's, you know. You know, and just taking it a step further, if you showed me a picture of my family, even for a fleeting second, it would help me. You, if you took it away, I would still be like, bam, 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 bam. So it's just the power of visual imagery, which we know is one of the, you know, greatest benefits of, of AAC. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's, I think, and having, again, organized so that you can quickly recall where they are and find them, you know. Yeah, and I love that organization piece too because that's that's what's so important, right? Being able to have things in a uniform fashion that make it easy to, you know, find, um, and that's what what the benefit of 
you know, these grid systems are, is that we can very easily navigate. Um, and that's something that's so important when we're, you know, working with kids with AAC and assessing kids for AAC is making sure that, you know, we're supporting their ability to navigate and navigate independently and, um, you know, setting things up so that it makes sense. Um, it makes sense for, for the user and, you know, their specific experience and um, individual characteristics. Well, I'm really excited to actually dive right into our interview with Scott Badish. He's from the Autism Society of America. So without further ado, let's head into the interview with Scott. Well, welcome back once again to Speech Science. This is Lucas Tuber, joined today by Scott Badish of the uh, Autism Society of America. How are you, sir? Fine. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm uh, enjoying our, our Portland weather out here, uh, although I understand yours is a little up and down right now. Yeah, it's Washington, D.C. Everything's up and down in Washington, D.C., so, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so why Fair should the point. weather be any different, right? So. Yeah. Fair point. Very good point. Well, um, uh, you know, I guess, first of all, I'd just like to ask you um, just to tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you to where you are today. Well, I'm soon to be 65, and um, my professional career now has been 43 years. Um, and I originally, uh, I've always, I grew up in a family that was very um, social service oriented um, and very much uh, of giving back and, and learned at a very early age of the responsibility of of helping your neighbor and, and helping uh, those who have needs. And um, I pursued my college and graduate degree in social service administration and went to work for United Ways um, and loved working there okay. uh, for for a long time. Um, I, I then, um, as much as I loved United Way, um, I, I got approached about getting involved with the Autism Society. And I, um, I've always felt that um, government um, services for people in need, um, it, it's, it's, it's not a fair system, and I always felt that um, it's fairer to the haves than the have-nots. Uh, yeah, it's sure. fair. It's it's fairer to those who have access to certain people that others may not, and usually that access is based upon you being part of the haves, you know, um, sure. clientele. And I and I, you know, I, I thought of little things like you know how an IEP meeting um, is set up that I was always able to, you know, had an employer who said you know, take your time off and I didn't lose any work. But if I was a hourly worker working at a Wendy's or a McDonald's, I would lose, you know, I would lose salary if I had to go there. And that's not fair. So I I felt that if in the, toward the ending of my career, um, if I could help change that and, and help uh, make the system uh, better, but also more fair, that that's why I wanted to do what I'm doing. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, someone may say, yes, you did or you didn't. I think we are moving um, to a, a little more fair system. It's, it's, it's a very difficult task, but I also think uh, we're making sure others know that the system of accessing help is, is one that's, uh, if you're poor, if you're a minority, if you um, live in rural areas, uh, uh, it, it's going to be more difficult to get help than it is if you're uh, the opposite of those three categories. Yeah. Right. I think that's, I, I fully agree. I think that's a theme that we see quite a bit. Um, you know, on, on that topic, you know, obviously what, what you do, the, the role that you have with the Autism Society is potentially a pretty political one. And you've, you've appeared in front of Congress a number of times. And I um, had asked you about um, a, a, a rebuttal that you wrote of the tax bill in 2017. Um, how, how do you feel about where we're headed now, I guess? You just said maybe, maybe positive. Well, <laughs> no, not at all. No. <laughs> okay. I, um, I think as you uh, get in your latter years, uh, you become less politically correct and, <laughs> and, and don't mince your words as well as you should. But uh, I think it's the most challenging time I've seen in my professional career, if not my life, um, because it's so difficult to predict what, what is happening. You know, if you look just back at the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, well, and I, I like what you said about the – the complexity of the the bills too. I mean, it's sometimes it's, it's, sometimes there's just so much information that it's hard to yeah. parse out. And that may yeah. be intentional. I mean, it may be like, yeah, don't worry, we're going to take care of this and this and this. But you know, we have people that we work with daily who read and understand the bill, and 
you know, and, and I, this is not an indictment on every member of Congress or every state legislator, because there certainly are some very, very good people who, who know what to do and know how to do it and know how to compromise. It's just, it's just there's a climate out there right now that suggests it's okay not to help people, and you know that's that's just not acceptable. And and you know part of our job and the job of every agency to advocate is to say, wait, you know this is not what we want to have happen. Right. So 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 I guess that is a perfect segue to ask about the Austin Society um, of America sure. is obviously you know a pretty pretty large, pretty well known um, charity. You know, is, is part of what you see the role of, of um, the Autism Society to, to sort of fill in those gaps that aren't being covered then? Well, I, I, I you know, I, I think the Autism Society has a lot of roles. You know, one is we're, we're, we're very inclusive. So we're the, we're the only national group that I know of in the autism field that, you know, has as our stakeholders individuals who are autistic, parents, professionals, and community leaders. So one is, I think we are uniquely set up to resolve ways to address needs um, uh, and, and also to be very insistent upon hearing the voice and, 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 and needs of the autistic community. Um, and I think, so, so I think our primary thing is that when we decide what we want to do, there's a really good internal process to make sure it's really what's needed and it will work. Um, the second thing is I think, yes, we have to help people who need help that aren't getting help. I mean, you know, when you have states um, in, in a number of states where you have to wait eight years for, you know, government-funded services, your needs don't wait eight years. So we have to be there to help those individuals. Uh, and we do that. You know, we helped probably close to a million people last year, which is a lot. Um, but at the same time, we don't want – those who should be morally or ethically responsible off the hook. So we also have stepped up in the last year or two or three um, our advocacy efforts. Um, you know, if, if government says we have no money for anything, that's one thing. But when government says they have no money for what we do and, and to help people uh, or to help people directly but has money for everything else, then we got to say, wait, wait, wait. So I think our advocacy role has increased. And I would tell you, you know, we're nonpartisan. We, you know, we, we call out uh, both sides of the aisle when they do something wrong. Um, you know, we've had issues with the Obama administration. We have issues with, with the Trump administration. We try to, you know, address those and, and resolve them in, in, in a very polite way. And, you know, I'm something that I insist upon our our efforts and as is our board. But it's, um, it's difficult to, to meet needs when, the needs are growing, and money, you know, government as a player is cutting back. I, I, I imagine, yeah. So when, it, you know, there, there was a time when I was involved, um, you know, in some of the, I don't even know what to call it, but the workshop committees for the Austin right. Society of America, right? And, um, you know, at that time, we were, there was a pretty healthy debate around, um, you know, providing funding for training in early intervention versus, sure. um, you know, transitional, uh, you know, vocational sort of stuff. Where where are the priorities lying now for the ASA moving forward? Well, we start by saying the individual who's born whenever, and then there's a diagnosis of autism, we want to be a friend with that person and that family for life. So we want that individual to go from lifespan periods of early childhood to, to elementary to secondary to transition or post-secondary school to adulthood to older adulthood. And, and next, in, in retirement, we want people to, to advance and advance by short-term and long-term outcome goals. Um, and we've revised how we operate to being that we're all about how do we increase a person's quality of life in a partnership with, with the individual and, and, and the family. So to that end, when someone says, what do you place your emphasis, we place our emphasis on what what is needed for that individual that doesn't exist. Okay, so and how we approach it. So on early you know, preschool or before five services, you know, it's back in some communities, there's, you know, school districts have very good preschool programs and others they're not. In some states, um, insurance pays for some services that are available. In other states, they don't. Or 
In some states where insurance pays, there's not access to those services or those services, you know, are just not readily available to certain people. So part of it is, is you know, how do we get that even playing field I talked about? You know, in the school age years from, you know, kindergarten through graduation of high school, we still rely upon and, and work with public schools, but as everyone knows, no two public schools are alike. Some, you know, are, are exceptional in helping a student with with autism or any disability to really succeed and and soar through those years. Others are nothing but warehouses. So we, we look and say, okay, we can't replicate that. We can't replicate a, pu- a public school system, but we sure could hold those school those those schools accountable. We could educate parents on how to how to best present their the needs of their their their, their sons or daughters and and transition that so that individuals who have autism could start you know becoming their own self advocate. You know the area that we then hit of transition in adulthood is is an area that it has very little services um you know it's it's once you exit the high school at 21 or if you graduate before then um which is a goal we hope uh you know we know the odds of you finding a job um that will pay a livable wage is 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 slim at best you know we know the statistics on unemployment and underemployment for adults with autism remains you know 70 percent or more and just think of that you know Think of any group um, of individuals. If we had a nation where, where a woman had a 70% unemployment rate, there, there'd be riots in the streets. But right, you know, we have, right. we as a society have said it's, yeah, you know, it's okay, 70%. Don't worry about it. You know, it's horrendous. This is a national disgrace. But we haven't seen that change. So we work with companies that want to make that change that want to know how to hire and, and, and don't want and they want to hire people for jobs that are meaningful and and, and could create opportunities for those individuals um but they're you know but then you say okay if you're if you're helping someone be independent um and they may need some kind of housing support what's housing available what's the cost of housing is there public transportation or jobs so we're working with that um and and as you know there's just not a lot of services or support to help that individual uh you know beyond initial you know a couple months when they get to work for some vocational rehab um we're spending more time now dealing with with the older um you know plus 45 50 year old uh, man or woman who's autistic who who you know is beginning to to age um and and has certain needs that don't come when you're young um you know that that maybe have as a primary financial supporter to them a parent who's maybe dying and um you know how 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 are we working on making sure that that person is going to be helped if, if their parents die. Um, so it, it, each area has different requirements, and each area, because we're so grassroots, and one community they may be putting a lot of efforts on transition because that's what's missing in that community, whereas another community may be spending a lot of time on early childhood development because that's what's missing. So there's no set plan because we want to have all our affiliates to find what's best for that community, what works in that community. So what's the missing pieces and how do they advocate to get those missing pieces picked up? That I, I really like the uh, the sort of, like you say, grassroots or the bottom-up approach right. to that. And I know, the, of course, the ASA has uh, many affiliates, right? I mean, sometimes even more than one in a single state, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're up to it. Well, we, we've had some mergers, which is good always because they, it enhances the ability. But we're very – unique in that we want a, an autism society to represent that community and is this is a massive country and what works in chicago doesn't work in portland and what works in portland may not work 50 miles in portland <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so we, we we don't want to have the one model fits all because it just doesn't work you know yeah and it, but we want also to engage a community to, to own and, and value their autism society as helping what works in their community you know and you know, it's probably a little better to be autistic in Oregon than to be autistic in Florida <laughs> because there's a, there's a little more commitment to support and services by government in those states. So you're always adjusting what works and doesn't work in one state. So. Yep, it's wildly variable. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right also that, you know, what what, hap- what works in Portland does not work 50 miles outside of Portland. That's very true. Right. Um, let alone New York City or <laughs> – Yeah, well, so that's so that's something that's um, that's pretty unique about ASA is is the grassroots piece. Like, what what else would you say is um, 
you know, not not to I guess jump right in with the the you know the difference that autism speaks and, and some of these other organizations, but what does differentiate you know ASA in terms of messaging well, I, or otherwise? I think a couple of things. One is we're very we're grassroots, so we we're very bottoms up. This office, you know, we we could require standards of operation that you know you have to have, you know, good financial management, governance, and staffing, and all that. But we we don't step into the, what works in Portland versus Washington versus California versus New York. We want that to be local. Um, our, our affiliates are autonomous. They're not. They carry the name Autism Society, but they're own corporations, so that they they have that autonomy. We're also heavily volunteer driven, which means, you know, I have a volunteer board um, that makes its decisions and governance, but so does every one of our affiliates. So. Um, you know, if you count the number of volunteers who give their time and their money, it's phenomenal. Um, we also raise money locally that stays locally. Any money that any affiliate raises stays there. We don't get any of it. If anything, we give some money to locals. Um, but, you know, so, uh, you know, 100 percent of what they get that's raised by a local affiliate is deter- how that spend is determined by that local board and that, that affiliate. And we don't say anything about it. I mean, as long as it's, it's done in a way that's proper and, and, and open. And the other thing is we're highly inclusive. Um, you know, we're real insistent that, that, you know, you don't make decisions about parents without parents, so you better not make decisions about people uh, who are on the spectrum without people on the spectrum as part of those decisions. We require and we monitor and make sure there's, there's involvement of that um, and, and there's fairness to that. And the other thing is we're not about research. You know, we view our role as that there's, you know, anywhere from one and a half to two million people who are autistic in this country, and, uh, you know, they need help now. You know, every money dollar we spend and every dollar spent at the field, it goes to health services. That doesn't mean we don't rely upon research and best practices. And then the other thing we're very big on is options. We never want to tell someone this is the only way you could help your son or daughter or this is the only way you could get help. We want to let the parent and or the individual make the decision of what's best for them. So we don't want to give the answer. We want people to say, look, you have to choose what works best for you or your son or daughter, and you best know that person, and you know if you're autistic what you need. And if you don't, someone's going to help you find that. But at the end of the day, you have to own does those decisions. So we try to create options anywhere. So if you say, what's a good dentist in town to take someone who's autistic, we'll say, here's you know, three or four dentists that we know are good. You know, if someone says, what's a good uh, you know, uh, 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 program for learning uh, job skills, we'll say, here's the programs in the community. Here's what each one offers. Here's someone who may have gone through it, so you may want to talk to them. But we want to make parents make those, parents and individuals to make those decisions. Great. Yeah, well, and I, that's I, I, one resource that I really yeah. appreciated is the listings yeah. that often, like, affiliates will yeah. build, um, those sorts of things. Um, you know, anyone listening, I encourage you to check that out for your area because yeah. I know at least in the Oregon market here, we've got, I mean, that, the listing's quite big. It's, there's, there's a lot of resources. You know, if you go to www.autism-society.org in our autism source, which you could access on our website, has 30,000 plus listings. Plus we, we have, you know, professional staff able to take your call 12 hours a day from nine to nine Eastern time. But, um, those calls are um, nine to nine Monday through Friday Eastern. Uh, those operators help uh, people who sometimes have significant needs and are saying, I, I need help, and we try to help them. That's great. Um, I, I wasn't aware that, that the national organization had a, a phone number that way as well. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, going back to the, the, the piece of choice, and, and so now I am, I'm poking a little bit into the, the controversial things, but sure. you know, you've um, gone on the record even with a congressional committee uh, dismissing the concept of vaccines or to blame, for example, for ASD. Um, I, do you stand by that now, obviously, today? And then mm-hmm. has that been challenging for you? To- well, you know, it's a, it's, it's a controversial issue. You know, we talk to experts um, in the research field that we have confidence are giving us the answer, and they consistently say there is absolutely no evidence uh, of good research to suggest that there's a correlation between a direct correlation between vaccines and 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 um and autism. Um, I'm soon to be a grandfather, and if my daughter or son-in-law says to me, "Should their baby boy that they're going to have be vaccinated?" I would say definitely. When you're talking vaccinations or any type of medical 
aspects to help your kid, you shouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. But talk yeah, to your, right. talk to your sure. physician, you know, and and the physician will know. And if you want to read studies on your own, we'll be happy to give you those studies, or we could refer you to places for the study. But you know, the studies that 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 are often cited that suggest autism has a link are, are studies that have been debunked, um, that have been found to not be reliable in reaching their conclusions. And um, you know, and, and I understand what parents may believe or an individual may believe that they may have gotten autism from vaccine, but it, it doesn't have, it's, there's no correlation. I mean, we, we don't know what the cause is. So, it, it, you know, it, it's what we, we tend to do is know what not the cause is. <laughs> so we, you know, there's enough evidence to say that the, the relationship of vaccine and, and autism, there's no relationship. I would tell everyone who's listening to this, and it's not me who should make that decision. It's a parent with their doctor. Right, right. I, I had to, I, I agree with you completely, and I, I had to ask that one because I know yeah. for myself, even as, you know, a related health professional, that's probably one of the number one questions right. I get asked all the time. Sure. Um, what, what do you think, what are some other questions that you get asked a lot? I, I get asked a lot about the cause, you know, it, and, and I understand that. I mean, it's, I understand why people, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I have a heart issue. Um, I, I'm 64, soon to be 65. That heart attack when I was 39. I know my grandfather, his, my great grandfather, my grandfather, and my dad all had heart issues. So it, I know it's heredity, okay? But I don't know what caused that heredity. You know, what? what why do I have it? Okay. So, but I, I'm able to learn. I'm able. There, there's enough good research and cardiologists could sit down and show me a diagram and show what my artery and heart looks like and show me the problems. Autism, you can't do that. So, you know, so parents particularly and some individuals ask us, you know, what may have caused this? Is it hereditary? Is it is it something people are born with? Is it something they, that, that you get? Is it caused by the environment? Is it caused by genes? Is it caused by, you know, the thousands of chemicals out there? Um, and unfortunately, we can't say yes. So what we try to say is, look at, you know, there's studies being done, but in the meantime, you know, let's put the attention not so much what caused it, but let's put the attention on how we could help the person with autism. And the other thing we want to say is that, you know, it's not someone, I'm going to say this politely so no one yells at me, you know, it, it's not, a parent didn't do anything wrong if their child is born with autism. No different sure. than my mother and father did anything wrong in the fact that I have a heart issue. I mean, that's that's what happens. It's not, you know, we try to tell parents when they call us and individuals when they call us, let's embrace this, let's work with this, and there's mentors, There's we are going to help you get through this. And the other question I get a lot of is, you know, how do you define autism? For someone like like you, Lucas, and my son, who who is able to to be very verbal, um, in my case with my son, you know, he has needs and he lets me talk about them. But he you know, he went to college; he lives on his own. That's autism. But on the other end, everyone knows someone who needs twenty four hour care, who is very self injurious, um, who if left alone, safety may be a major issue. Um, right. Sure. So, so, how, so a question I get asked a lot when I speak is how do you, how do you define that such a big spectrum? How do you address out of priority, even if there's little money, who gets help first? So we get asked that, you know. And my theory is, and our organization is, when you have to prioritize, safety has to come first. You know, the safety of an individual. But you know, you, you have to prioritize the person in most need. But sometimes someone who appears to be very high functioning may have significant needs and they're just not readily visible. So we get asked that a lot and, and that's a tough question to answer. You know, the other question we get asked is um, about a cure. It's a tough issue because, you know, um, it, it, there are people on the spectrum who I have the utmost respect for and my son is including one who has embraced his autism and doesn't want to be cured or whatever. There are others who may want to be cured. We don't want to get into that debate a lot because, you know, we want to create a world where 
if you have autism, you're accepted, you're valued, you're given opportunity, you're, you're supported, you're helped, and we're going to get you to the highest level of quality of life possible. And, you know, all those other things of cause and cure and research, put those on the side. We're going to help get your son or daughter to that point and help you as an individual get to that point. All those questions sound very familiar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I know one of the ones you mentioned that I get asked a lot is the, uh, you know, there's autism and then there's autism sort of quote, of, right. you know, like right. what is, what is the self injurious versus the other. And, you know, I think one thing I've, I've said before, and maybe I'm right with this, but is that a lot of people conceptualize spectrum as a line, you know, when really it could be right. a color wheel of, you know, Definitely. strengths and, and these things, you know, and, um, I think a lot of folks don't think of it that way. They think of it as high functioning or low functioning when really it's right. a lot more complex. Well, and also um, you may have people with any type of condition has sometimes have dual conditions. You know, we see a lot of people with autism may have hearing issues, may have uh, depression, mental health issues, and that's with any one of us. You know, you know, I, I have a heart issue. I probably, you know, so usually it's you're dealing with people. You know, that's one of the things you're dealing with is is how do you help a person when it may be not only autism impacting that that needs to be helped so we can move people along it may be that they can't hear so you know how do we help both and and so that's another big issue we try to tell people it's just not a you know it's not always just a single type of issue we're dealing with a lot of complexities right and one of them like you say i mean none of us none of us are defined by any one single thing about yeah. us right you know yeah absolutely it's um yeah it's uh yeah my my favorite story is when you know in the autism community there's this big fight between how do you describe someone who has an autism diagnosis, and there's a lot of people, I mix this up all the time, so correct me if I'm wrong, about first person, that, you know, this is a person who lives with autism versus someone who's autistic. So I asked my son, I said, you know, you're my expert. Tell me how do you want to be described, and whatever you describe is how I'm going to describe in my job. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, Evan, um, should I describe that you live with autism or that you're autistic? And he thinks for a second and he says, Dad, I live with you. I don't live with autism. So. <laughs> so I, just, I said, I'm going to yell that one or the other, so I'm going with what my son tells me. <laughs> Put the blame on him. So. No, that's good. Yeah, that's the, per the person first language thing is something that comes up a lot for us, too. And, yeah. you know, I, I, that's the only answer I really feel like I can offer is that it's up to the individual, yeah. you know, with autism. Yeah. I mean, it's not my place to say, you know. I guess if there was one place that you feel like, um, you know, if we can invest all of our energy in one area, like what's, what's the, the biggest issue facing uh, neurodiverse communities today? I think the biggest issue we're facing right now is, is honestly is, well, two issues. is this whole thing we started this whole conversation with is this, how do we get a country to really see this as a need? <laughs> and yeah. this is a need that we as, you know, as Americans, as human beings need to address. Uh, the second big issue that really keeps me worried is, is this growing rift between parents who want the best for their children, adult or young, who are on the spectrum versus those on the spectrum who may not respect the parents, but their parents may not respect those who are speaking on behalf of people with autism. And, and both sides are right and both sides are wrong. <laughs> As I say, you know, um, and that fight, it gets worse. And one of the things I do in my job is, is I call that out when that happens because um, any time change occurs um, in our society, you need everyone to be part of that change. So my feeling is we all want the same thing, and we need to all agree that we may have some differences, but we all want the best for every person with autism. And how we say it and how we talk to each other may sometimes not imply that, but I know in talking to everyone, they all want the best. So right. that's, that's a great message. And yeah. you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I haven't seen, um, I, I, there's nothing in my work that can get as vicious as the debates about, about autism, oh, whether that's etiology or what it is. And it, it's remarkable, but it is important to remember. Yeah. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Everybody wants the best. I have had more congressmen or senators tell me that they're afraid to take a position and I understand this. I would be, too, because they said, you know, what you're asking for, someone just came in and wanted the total opposite. So 
part of it is also is how do you get the community together to come up with a common agenda. Politicians uh, don't want everyone screaming at them. So it's almost, we almost create the environment where they say, look, how, how can you have me act on your behalf if you all can't decide what you're asking me to act on your behalf for? And I understand that. I've been told that many times. And, you know, and we just need to get everyone to say, look, we may disagree, but let's look at how much progress we've done in the last 20 years, and maybe we're not doing as anywhere near what's needed, and maybe our approach needs to change a lot. And my organization, every organization, needs to take a look at that. So, For the organization to be that introspective, especially with the, you know, the volunteer board and the size of the board, I mean, that's, that's fantastic. And certainly it's one of the reasons why, you know, I've supported ASA. So, well, I, and, and I, you're, you're a very strong you – know, I mean that's 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 the other difference we have is we have thousands of people supporting us and that you know you're surrounded by so many wonderful and beautiful people caring. Yeah. Well, on on that note, is there is there any one message you know that you'd like to convey to the, well, the I want, health professionals? Go ahead. I, I want people to hear this. Okay. Sure. And and I I know our time is. I want people not to accept no. That's my new mantra. <laughs> okay. Because. I don't want people who petition, who advocate with their schools, with their government, with us, with anyone, who are just to easily accept no, because no is such an easy thing to say. So I know in my life with my son's IEP meetings and in and, and, and the work I do that you so often get told no when no is not an acceptable answer. If someone says no, listen to the reason why and then ask them why does that reason apply to me? And, and I'll give you the example. Um, you know, if, if government says I can't afford to help provide money to reduce the waiting list in Florida, um, Fort Lauderdale Airport built a brand new runway. It, brand new runway, I think, if I look if I'm correct, cost like $1.3 billion. And the reason they did it, which was tremendously good reason, was they realized that with increased air traffic over time, um, they would need a second runway. And, for someone who's flying on a plane two, three days a week, that's I like that. You know, that means you're not waiting to, to take off or land. Um, so they thought forward thinking. In Florida, there's at least an eight-year wait for services for people with a disability. Wow, that one. Um, imagine if they took the one billion, didn't build the runway, and put it toward that services. How many people could have been helped? And, and that money would have a much better. It would have a strong replication job as far as tax dollars and, 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 and money into the economy. So then you say to government, well, how could you do that? And they'll say, well, that's fees we collect, and, and it's, it has to be used for, for, for the airport. Well, no, it doesn't. That's a decision government makes. Government could use those fees to help people who have needs. You know, you could do that. I mean, right. we use license fees when you get married. A lot of states use those fees to help um women and men who are victims of domestic violence. That's a good decision, in my opinion. But there's, there's, there's no good rational thinking when, when you could say, I could build an extra runway, and I'm not picking on Fort Lauderdale, but, but I'm picking on government leaders who say they don't see something wrong with not doing both. People should get mad in, in, a, in a polite way. I'm not, you know, be very cordial, be very nice. Right. You got to start looking at the people are waiting eight years and and the thousands on waiting list. That's a national disgrace. Well, and like you said, I didn't, I didn't want to end up in such a bummer note, but <laughs> I know that, that that's the coordinate yeah. thing because everyone no, it, is saying that's a call to action, right? This thing has got to be about equity and fairness. And well, Mr. Bader, thanks so much for your time. Oh, um, thank you, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, those of you listening, um, if you found us on uh, on iTunes or through Facebook, take a look down below. We'll have a link to the Autism Society of America. Uh, if it's on Facebook, of course, there'll be a fun little donate button there, too, um, to support this awesome group. Uh, Mr. Betis, thanks for your time joining us today. Hey, listen, uh, thank you, buddy. Ahead. I really, you're educating and helping a lot of people. So uh, one of the ways we get our message out is through you. So God bless you and thank your listeners and tell them to get right. active. Tell thanks them to so go much. to Fort Congratulations on <laughs> becoming a, a grandfather soon. Well, thank you. Talk <laughs> All right. to you later. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to Scott Badish for coming on. Uh, that was a really great conversation. 
As always, please join our conversation, find our Facebook group uh, online and leave us a comment. We've been having a lot of really great discussions on there. So we would love for you to join us and uh, tell us what you think about the podcast. Um, let us know if you have a question. Uh, we love hearing from you guys. So please um, hop on Facebook and, and say hello. Rachel, it's been hopping over there, right? I mean, there's been people posting and asking questions. We get in there and then we answer them and then people, we ask questions back because we don't know everything. We, are, we just know what we know, right? Yeah, the dialogue has been really wonderful. I, I mean, I'm, I'm learning so much through all of our, you know, loyal listeners and it's just, it's so exciting because that's the beautiful thing about, you know, connecting on social media is that there's so many different perspectives and, and we get to share that together. And speaking of loyal listeners, thank you, loyal listeners, if you hit the subscribe button. And if you haven't, now is the time. You don't want to miss another episode. Subscribing, what that means, wherever po whatever podcasting tool you use, when you hit the subscribe button, it means you never miss an episode. So it automatically comes to your device and you get whatever, whatever content we push out to you. So don't miss anything. Hit subscribe. For Talking With Tech, I'm Rachel Madel, joined by Chris Bouguet. Thank you guys so much for listening. And we will... Talk to you next week.